So let us begin with a quick recap of what we have seen so far. We have tried to solve equations such as these and we saw that you can always take this A to a rho reduced echelon form like so, right? And then we saw that if you want to solve for Ax is equal to 0 under certain situations precisely when you have a greater number of variables and the number of equations, there will always be a solution to this, a non-zero, non-trivial solution to this. But how does that help us in solving the overall thing? Now, of course, once you've gotten it to this uh, row reduced echelon form, right, what you need to add on to the solution of this, like this complementary part is essentially just this b hat, right? So for instance, if you've written your x to be something like u1, plus something like, uh, let's say C1, C2, right? Like so. So there'll be one part, let's say some CK. There'll be one part that is precisely this part which will satisfy Rx is equal to zero and therefore Ax is equal to zero. To that, if you also add B hat, that will be your solution, right? So this is precisely not the solution of this, but also the solution of this, yeah? So that part is hopefully clear. So although I didn't explicitly mention that you have to also solve for Ax is equal to B, but from the way we solved and worked it out, this solution of course will of course only exist if the rank condition checks out. Right? We showed you that, that if you have this R and you check the row rank of this, and if you check the row rank of R with B hat, only if the ranks of these two fellows are the same, only then this checks out and you can get a solution. We've also seen that, right? So otherwise it doesn't make sense. So then the question still remains as to what do you do when no solution exists? We will not be in a position to answer that question completely till we have addressed topics such as inner product spaces. Okay, and for those we will deal with very specific type of number systems such as real and complex numbers. And talking about number systems, it is precisely this that led us to our next topic which was we started studying this group, this object that we called a group, right? It's essentially nothing but a sort of a number system, a counting system. You're defining certain operation with certain properties. Why do we do that? Because we want to push our luck and see whatever we did in obtaining the row reduced echelon form, can we extend it to other number systems as well, right? So first thing we understood was groups and then we also saw that with the additional property of commutativity, you also get abelian groups, right? Now we're going to look at something more, something beyond just groups. If you notice the way I wrote that solution over there, it was something like summation CI <coughs> VI, at least a part of the solution was of this form. So there are basi basically two operations that happened. One, which was addition of certain n tuples of numbers. The other was scaling of those n tuples of numbers by some scalars. But so far when we described groups, we have only spoken about one kind of operation. Right. So it means that if we want to get a fuller understanding of what's going on in an abstract sense, we need to talk about not just a set with one operation, one binary operation, but with two binary operations, right? So in addition to what we have defined so far with groups where we have a set and presumably an operation where of course this plus stands for any operation that you want, any binary operation, but let's call it addition for the time being. So this is quote unquote addition. It can be anything that I want it to be provided it satisfies those rules. And let's also talk about a second operation, which we will call as the multiplication. Again, within quotes, because this is not by any means to be read as only the usual multiplication that you're familiar with, okay? So we need a set 
with one oper binary operation that is addition and another binary operation that is called a multiplication to satisfy certain properties and if it does so then we give it a certain name. So we are going to try and introduce that. So suppose S with this addition is an abelian group okay that already tells you a lot about S with respect to this operation and the following hold. So you can already guess that what we are going to say subsequently has got everything to do with S with respect to the second operation that we are going to now describe. So what are the properties? First property there exists a unique one all right when I say one what I mean is essentially a multiplicative identity yeah in S such that one times A is equal to A times one is equal to A for all A belonging to S okay. So what do we have a set with the addition a binary operation and a multiplication another binary operation such that there is an identity element with respect to the multiplication operation that I am going to define on that set okay. Of course uh, needless to say maybe I should just mention it in a different manner. over which S is closed yeah. So I am not even going to like make that a different point that closure property is a given right you take two fellows in the set you act using this binary operation of multiplication what you get should also be a part of that set right. So that closure is already kind of taken for granted. So then the first important property is that you have this a multiplicative identity. The second property for A, B, C belonging to S we have A operation B operation C is equal to A operation B operation C. The order will not matter you know what this property is called it is called associativity hmm? just to refresh your memory it is called associativity right. Anything else you think is worth adding here to this distributivity. So these are pertaining exclusively to the multiplication operation but now when you have two operations how do those two operations combine with one another is what is described by the property of distributivity. So we have as point 3 for A, B, C in S, A acting on B plus C is equal to A acting on B plus A acting on C and B plus C being acted on by A is equal to B acted on by A plus C acted on by A. So these two together give you distributivity of multiplication over addition. So the multiplication operation distributes over the addition. Anything else? We will not go into that with this itself we have the makings of a certain structure okay. Can you think of an example of something that you are familiar with which already meets this? Yeah. 
well that is maybe you know going too special. Suppose you consider a set of matrices of size 5 cross 5, 10 cross 10, n cross n where n is a finite integer, positive integer. What about matrices? Do they meet this, these properties? You have an identity with respect to addition, you, so it is an, it's an abelian group with respect to addition. Commutativity, commutativity is there. So, with respect to multiplication, we are not demanding commutativity, in which case it is fine, right? If you are taking square matrices, the products need not commute, but you do not ask for commutativity here. What you ask for is this associativity, which is true. What you ask for is distributivity, which is also true, left distributivity, right distributivity. There is no issues with this, right? So, already you see the set of matrices satisfies this. Now, this has a name. We call it a ring with identity, okay. This is called a ring with identity, identity and you already see that the set of matrices, the familiar ones that you are familiar with the square matrices, they already meet this condition, all, all of these conditions. So, they qualify as a ring with identity under the usual matrix addition and multiplications, right? What if I now impose the condition that let us add a condition, okay? The multiplication Actually, I should probably also, okay, this I have already written. The multiplication is also commutative, all right? Then what we get is, okay, I have not got space here, so let me write it here. A commutative ring with identity. Any example comes to mind of a commutative ring with identity? Think of, yes? Set? Yeah, again, rational numbers have something more, not just this. They actually, that is an overkill. You are right. So, see, there is there's a set with certain rule bases. The more the number of rule bases you add, you are actually shrinking that set. Hmm? But I am more interested in getting an example of a set that just about meets this but nothing extra in addition because if they meet something extra then they probably got a different name. So, I do not want to go super specialized into that. So, integers, but that is this again something more we will add and then integers will qualify. We will sharpen this a little more and then integers will fit in perfectly. Right now integers fit in, but it is a loose fitting. It is like you bought clothes for a child for the next two, three years allowing him or her to grow into the clothes. Right? It is still got more room. Integers have something more, not just this. Think of polynomials, right? So, they commute, yeah? If you did not have the commutativity property, would they still be part of this? They would because commutativity is, so something that is part of a subset is obviously part of the superset. So, if you had given me an example of a polynomial as a ring with identity, yeah, it is valid, sure, but it has got some more property. But now when I have refined it, you see the matrices that I had described just a while back, they do not form a commutative ring, the square matrices, right, under the usual addition and multiplication. But now, the polynomials just fit in with this. See, we are not asking for inverses yet, right? If we did, then we would have problems with polynomials because the inverse of a polynomial in the way we understand divisions and all would be a rational function, not a polynomial. So, it does not belong to the set of polynomials, the inverse of a polynomial, unless it is just a constant polynomial, right? So, therefore, the polynomials give you an example of a commutative ring with identity, okay? Now, I am going to add another line here, okay, a commutative ring with identity 
which satisfies the property that whenever a into b is equal to 0, either a is equal to 0 or b is equal to 0. Of course, a and b belong to s, yeah. Either a is equal to 0 or b is equal to 0 or both is called, anyone's heard of this? Yes, it is called an integral domain. So, I am deliberately making a grammatical mistake by using capital letters in the middle of a sentence, but that is because it is the name, so it is important. Now, if you talk about integers, of course, they are an integral domain because the integral domain gets its name from integers, everything that behaves like integers. Can you think of a a place where you have used this from a very young age, you have been using this property every now and then. When you solve equations, quadratic equations, cubic equations, you factor out a polynomial and the next step you say is either x is equal to this or x is equal to this or x is equal to this and so on and so forth, right. It never occurs to you that it is quite possible that the product of two numbers that are non-zero can turn out to be zero. However, let me give you an example of a situation where that may be the case, kind of like a counter example. So consider the system of numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and the operations, this is S, okay. And the operations are plus modulo 6 and product modulo 6, all right. Now look at the product of 3 and 2. Is 3 0 modulo 6? Is 2 0 modulo 6? But what is 3 into 2 zero, modulo 6? Right? So you can never be sure unless you are dealing in integral domain. So this fellow clearly is not an integral domain, right? Yeah? So I have clearly given you an example of some operation, some set with two operations where the, the condition that we often take for granted need not necessarily be true. So as I said, you have to forget all that you have learned and look at only the operation in and of itself, right. So this is not an integral domain. If you are solving for equations in this, you will have to be very careful, right. You cannot always say that, you know, things that we are so used to believing in. If you have a fifth degree polynomial equation, you say there are five roots. We take those things for granted. Nothing is for granted. You can have more than five roots. You can have less than five roots. You can have probably no roots. Depending on the number system in which you are living, you may not have any roots, right? So funny things happen. For example, you know this typical thing. You have zero and one, right? Sorry, I should give it a set notation. You have 0 and 1 and you take addition and multiplication with respect to modulo 2. That is a binary number system basically, right. So if you take x plus y times x plus y in this, usually we write this is as x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. But now if you take modulo 2, this is of multiple of 2, always an even number. So this vanishes. So indeed that 2xy becomes an extra. Right? So this becomes equal to x squared plus y squared. So for people who think in binaries, that is an extra. Right? So these things have to be kept in mind. What is the set and what is the operation under which you are acting? The rules of the operation must be respected. Okay. But we are not done yet. So this is an integral domain, okay. This is clear. So maybe I can erase this part because now we will go deeper with that or rather we will take a sort of a digression into defining another sort of objects which are not necessarily a subspecialization of a commutative ring with identity, 
rather we will now talk about a division ring okay now from all of these properties we get rid of this blue property so we are back to dealing with a ring with identity so what is a division ring a division ring in addition to satisfying all the properties of a ring with identity it is a ring with identity such that for all a belonging to s sans the zero element yeah there exists a inverse such that a inverse times a is equal to 1 and a times a inverse is equal to 1. So, every non-zero element yeah, if it has a multiplicative inverse in a ring with identity then such a ring is called a division ring. Now, unfortunately not all division rings are commutative. If you have ever come across things like quaternions, how many of you have heard of quaternions? Okay, they lost a bit of popularity, but they are again back in business in you know last century or so. Okay. So, these quaternions is a classic example of forming a division ring, yeah, but they are not a commutative division ring, okay, because the quaternion multiplication. So, every non-zero element, every non-zero quaternion has an inverse. Yeah, but the operation, the multiplication with uh, quaternions is not commutative. Okay, so you do have ring, which is the basic structure. Then, if you add the commutativity property, you get a commutative ring. With a commutative ring, if you impose the other property, that is, product of two non-zeros, that is, non-additive identities, can only be zero if at least one of them is zero. Otherwise, they can never be zero. So, product of two non-zeros is never zero. Then, it's an integral domain. Okay. Now you get rid of the commutativity again, forget about the integral domain bit, go back to the basic structure of a ring with identity, just impose the condition that apart from all of this, there must also be a multiplicative inverse. If it is so, if there is a multiplicative inverse for every non-zero entry in the set, then it is a division ring. So these concepts are clear, there is, I hope that you do not suffer from any confusion between which is a subset which is contained in this. A division ring is quite apart, right? It is not contained in anything. It does not have to meet commutativity. But if it does meet the property of commutativity, so I hope this part is clear, right? So at each stage, it is important maybe to remember some examples, as I said, because that will immediately help you recall what property is coming in, what property is going out. That often helps. It is a memory aid in some sense. So, here is a special name for a commutative division ring. So, each of those terms clearly tells you what we need is called a, uh, maybe I should write it with a capital letter, field, okay, the most important object that we will come across, it's the starting point of everything in formal linear algebra is this field, right. A commutative division ring is called a field. This is where our scalars will come from. This is the scalars on which we will build the structures of more sophisticated objects such as vector spaces which probably we will be able to cover today or at least start discussing. Okay. So, this is a field. So, hereafter we will see 
that everything that you did while trying to solve for those systems of equations ax is equal to b and got getting to that rho reduced echelon form is well and truly extendable provided your number system satisfies the properties of a field all right you might still be able to do quite a lot if it's a commutative ring many of those things can still be done yeah but a field makes life easy because it's exactly replicating whatever you did with real numbers in getting from any arbitrary matrix to its row reduced echelon form okay so let's see some interesting features or properties of what we are calling this as field right okay so this definition is kind of clear i hope because you know normally people would start a description of a field by writing out all properties but i have already done the hard work of writing those properties i've described what an abelian group is so you know with respect to addition it's an abelian group in fact you can also think of it like if you look at all the elements apart from the zero element then even multiplication is an abelian group for a field yeah it's a commutative the multiplication is commutative there is an identity there is associativity and apart from that so it's a abelian group with respect to addition without the zero it's an abelian group with respect to multiplication and then there is this distributivity that is the interplay of those two operations which is encapsulated by the distributivity property so that's a simple way of remembering instead of like oh there were 10 points i remember 9 what's the 10th it's not history it's mathematics right so you don't have to re recall things from memory that's the way you reason out hmm? so this is an example so of course the real numbers naturally are fields of course the complex numbers are also fields yeah so that brings us to this interesting notion of what is a sub field you know what is a subset given a set if you take some of the elements of that set and cook up another set that is a subset so does it mean that r is of course a subset of c but is r a sub field of c in this case it is so all right but in general can we always say that we have a number system say for example 0 1 2 uh, yeah let's just stop there with addition modulo 3 and multiplication modulo 3 so this sorry right this is you can check an example of a field let's call this z3 let's take another z2 which i've just written a while back that's the binary now of course this set is a subset of this but is this a subfield of this what do you think why not it is a subfield how many of you think it's a subfield z2 is a subfield of z3 what do you what's your best guess exactly so when you're talking about subfields you cannot just afford to look at only the sets you see you have to also look at whether the operation is inherited from the so called super super field or whatever you call it right so this operation and this operation are different so even if the sets look like they are subsets of one another that doesn't make it a subfield the operation must be respected only then it's a subfield so just thinking about it in this manner you can already figure that subfield will demand that you have certain elements in it for example you need the 0 and 1 without that you cannot make it a subfield right so we will hopefully have by now we have defined what is subfield here and fields at least we have given you an idea of what is a subfield so that brings kind of this segment to a close but now next we shall look at some further interesting properties and the relations between these integral domains and fields and whatnot okay and we shall study them in some closer detail we'll do a few proofs <laughs>